I I'm telling everybody, as are most uh, political folks in Florida, don't, don't sleep on our state. We, uh, we have some metrics that are emerging. Uh, remember, for, for most election cycles in the, this century, mm. uh, we have been a purple state. We've been hyper-competitive. Barack Obama won Florida both times that he ran. And uh, I'll give you an example from just yesterday's primary. The enthusiasm among Democratic voters is off the charts. I mean, just to give you an idea, I won my primary, but it's not the win. It's the difference in the voter turnout between Democrats and Republicans. 34,000 people voted in, uh, you know, I got 34,000 votes. The primary winner on the Republican side got 13,000 votes. So just in terms of enthusiasm, you can see the difference. But polling last week, both national polls that came out that polled Florida had, it, had the race within three um, and five. And then if you look at the volunteer organization on the ground, 22,000 people signed up to volunteer to elect Kamala Harris president of the United States. So with the resources and also the Republicans have continued to distort their advantage. They say they have a million more registered voters in Florida. They don't. What they did was that they suppressed the voters who haven't voted in two elections and now show them as inactive, even though they're still registered. So there aren't a million more Republicans re registered to vote. We have huge enthusiasm. We beat ev almost every Moms for Liberty candidate that Ron DeSantis endorsed for school board races last night, about almost two dozen that he endorsed. and he only won six of them. So the momentum is in our direction. No one should sleep on Florida. Well, it, interesting, and looking more broadly, Florida and across the country, and not just the swing states, Congresswoman, our, our listeners and viewers should be reminded that you were chair of the DNC during Barack Obama's second convention yes. uh, as president of the United States. Will you seek to duplicate his map? Well, what we're, what we're seeking to do is make sure that we can capitalize on the enthusiasm and the contrast between the momentum that we have under Kamala Harris and Tim Walls because hope and optimism, like we had during the Obama years, and joy is what is pushing people forward because they want a, a, a president who is going to fight for them to reduce prescription drug prices. But you are talking about more states than you were when Joe Biden was at the top of the ticket? There is no question right now that we have different math in multiple different directions than we had just five, five or six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And so what we can't do is just, you know, move forward without pivoting and making the kind of adjustments that we need to and being nimble. And that's what our campaign operations are doing right now. And uh, they're, they're doing some recalculations so they can be <laughs> ready for any opportunity. Well, and I wonder how those recalculations are factoring into the likelihood of not just getting the majority in the House, but how large you think your majority could potentially be with Harris at the top of the ticket. You obviously are a member of House leadership. Has the has the goalposts moved? Initially, it was like, you just got to get those four seats. But what's the target now? Well, we have to net four seats. And we have a very clear advantage in the fundraising. We, we have consistently outraised the NRCC, the Republican campaign finance operation, every single quarter of this election cycle. But it's not that just that. Our incumbent frontline margin, marginal members, they've outraised their opposition, our red to blue candidates. They have a recruitment problem. They've, they've got right-wing extremists all over the map. So the contrast is clear all the way down the ticket from the White House pair of candidates down to legislative races and voters are going to come out to the polls elect our candidates because they want some someone who's thinking about moving forward not a, a MAGA extremist Republican who's buried in the past, who's morose and brooding and unhappy. We've got to make sure that we have a positive forward thinking government so that we can ensure that this booming economy, 15 million plus jobs, making sure that we continue to bring prescription drug prices down, that we make sure that we have a plan like Kamala Harris does to make home ownership affordable and child tax credit reinstated. So many things that are important on the kitchen table, not a president like Donald Trump was who cared only about making sure that the wealthy and the profitable, and, and, and the profitable businesses are able to do even better. I want to ask you about 
an issue I know is very important to you and a lot of progressive Democrats, and that's our policy in Israel right now. It's yes. the reason why we've been talking about protesters that in some cases have not materialized here in Chicago. Congresswoman, there are reports today that U.S. and Israeli officials think that this proposal for a bridge ceasefire deal is on the verge of collapsing. We heard from Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Doha. Here's what he said. Our message is simple, it's clear, and it's urgent. We need to get the ceasefire and hostage agreement over the finish line, and we need to do it now. Um, time is of the essence. How important will it be for a ceasefire to be struck to find unity among progressives in the Democratic Party? What's important is that Hamas release the hostages. What's important is that Israel not be expected, like any, any other nation shouldn't be expected, to live with a terrorist threat sworn on their destruction and the killing of all Jews on their doorstep. What's important is making sure that the, the, terror, uh, the, the terror threat that Palestinians in Gaza live with is ended so that they, don't, that they can free Gaza from Hamas. And that, when we reach a ceasefire deal that releases those hostages, that ensures that we can have governance in Gaza that is peaceful and non-threatening, that is absolutely essential. The time that's running out is that we have 109 hostages still there, at least eight Amer that are American, that need to be freed. Uh, I mean, we have to make sure, and thank, thanks to the Biden-Harris administration for staying at the table, pushing the negotiations forward, but Hamas needs to take this deal. That is the bottom line. Well, and we'll wait to see if they do so and on what time frame, knowing that they also could be considering that it will be a different government come January if they drag this out long enough. You just mentioned what the Biden-Harris administration has done. Do you expect that there would be a serious departure from this administration's policy if it were instead a harris Walls? Administration, how does she Not differ from the incumbent president? She doesn't differ. She's made very clear that she is right alongside President Biden. That's she's been a part of those discussions, the negotiations. Kamala Harris supports making sure that we have a ceasefire deal that brings the hostages home, that ends the terrorist threat on Israel's doorstep, that ensures that we can get humanitarian assistance and relief to the Palestinians who are victimized by Hamas themselves, and also continuing the strong U.S. aid to Israel. Uh, she said very clearly she's not for an, an, an arms embargo. We have the strongest plank in the Democratic Party platform, strongest pro-Israel plank of any party uh, in, in, in decades. And the Republicans come nowhere near the commitments and the specificity in the Democratic Party platform that we have. And that's because the Democratic Party is the one that has solidly and consistently stood with Israel, not just in words, but in actions.